Good evening, it's half past five and welcome to this meeting of the Economy and Place Policy Development Committee. Um, members uh, in the main are uh, here as scheduled, but I've got Councillor Rawlings, apologies, and substituting is Councillor Doughty. I've got apologies from Councillor Stuart Barnes and Councillor Pavlovic is substituting for him. Um, this meeting is being webcast, uh, so I hope members will um, bear that in mind when they speak. Um, also, in terms of fire arrangements, should there be a fire alarm, it will not be a test. So the way out of this building, this room, is to take to my left, to the left of the wall that you're facing as you leave, on the corridor, out through the main doors, and perhaps gather in front of the Grand Hotel, where we can make sure that everybody's present. Um, and lastly, the facilities are along the corridor to your to our left, except for Mr. Mary's left. Um, so look forward then to um, interesting discussion, and we'll start with any declarations of interest from members who are present. Councillor Pavlovic. Um, just to clarify, Chair, that um, uh, I am the chair of the uh, Economy and Place Scrutiny Committee and therefore um, presenting the recommendations. If it does come to a vote, um, I, I won't vote because obviously um, I am commending it to you anyway. Anything else? No? Okay. Thank you for that, Councillor Pavlovic. I, I would have said something appropriate in due course had, it, had you not said that. Thank you. Okay, so uh, minutes of the previous two meetings on the 5th of November and the 20th of November last year. Uh, can I ask if members are uh, happy that these can be signed as a true record of what took place? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'll sign them at the end then. Um, thank you very much. Okay, and uh, we now have some public participation. I've got Mr Dave... <coughs> Dave Merritt um, to speak and Dave you've got the usual uh, three minutes I know you're familiar with the process so when you're ready uh, after, afternoon, uh, have you um, put the mic on oh, sorry apologies afternoon uh, everyone um, I wanted to uh, speak on the um, report uh, the scrutiny report that you've uh, drafted uh, it's obviously an extremely good report in terms of retail issues in the city centre. But I think, uh, as I've said at uh, previous meetings, one of the other big issues for the city has been the loss of office space in the city centre. Previous uh, Centre for Cities report actually identified York as having one of the highest, uh, if not the highest, uh, loss of uh, office space uh, of cities around the country. And uh, in your report, you've uh, highlighted a, another uh, Centre for Cities report, the Building Blocks report, and uh, in which uh, paragraph 17, uh, they make the point that uh, a lot of the more successful cities uh, have a large share of office space compared to other types of commercial property. So the fact that we've been losing office space so fast is obviously a big issue. And I think we need to remember that where does a lot of the daytime retail uh, come from? It actually comes from people who are working in the city centre and choose to do shopping in their lunch break after work and so on. So um, I, I hope you'd actually look to reflect that more. Um, when, when I was uh, a cabinet member, when the government first introduced the permitted development rights, uh, which removed uh, the need for planning permission for change of use from offices to uh, housing. Uh, we did look, uh, and actually, uh, Mike Slater put a report together in terms of looking to an Article 4 direction. The government wasn't very sympathetic at the time and turned it down as it did for a number of other cities. But uh, we now obviously have uh, for six years uh, experience since then. We have the evidence of the major loss of uh, office accommodation. So uh, I think one of your additional recommendations actually ought to be to relook at uh, an Article 4 direction for some of the key remaining city centre office spaces, at least until York Central 
comes on in terms of protecting the residual uh, office employment in the city centre. So that's the only point I wanted to make, uh, but I think it's an important one and I hope you all consider it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Merrick. Okay. Um, we then move on to the report itself. So um, I wonder if Ms. McCarran and Ms. Ashmore could join us at the table, please. And I'll use your first names after this, if that's all right. Good. And I've got Sarah on the left and Sophie on the right. Um, and I know that there have been apologies from Simon Burton, the uh, head of economic uh, growth. Ladies, would you, between you, like to take us briefly through the report? Uh, it doesn't need to be in huge detail, but any particular issues you want to point out along the way, that will be good. And I think Councillor Pavlovic, who is chair of the scrutiny committee, will, which produced this report, basically, will expand, um, not too much, but later on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. So the report was basically formed to inform members of the work carried out by the Economic, economic and Place Com Scrutiny Committee in the economic health of the city centre. So it outlined its aim as to understand the economic health of the city centre and to see where the council can influence the city centre economy. So we outlined our objectives as to examine all available evidence about York as a city centre and as a retail location and how this has changed over the years. We also aimed to consider the factors that influence the city centre economy and what role the council has to play in this. Furthermore, we tried to understand the global trends that underpin the changes in retail that have been seen particularly in the last 20 years. And finally, we wanted to try to identify the council's priorities with regard to the city centre economy. So the information was gathered regarding these different aspects and it was found that in 2016 a total of 20,500 people were employed in York City Centre which made up for around 18% of all the jobs. <coughs> However, over the past or 15 years nearly 4,250 jobs have been lost in the city centre and public administration showed the biggest loss with the total numbers of jobs halving Retail experienced a 20% reduction in employment, but food and beverages uh, ser services experienced a 40% gain. So this transition from re away from retail towards food and beverage services was partially credited by Deloitte, Deloitte and WIG to the rise of Leeds as a, city, as a regional hub and the decline of smaller, retail, smaller centres as retail locations. Um, it's clear that York does have a retail attraction, however, the increase in food and beverage has been partially credited to its rise as a tourism destination, with 7 million visitors in 2017 who spent £564 million. So this transition, this transition however, hasn't stopped our vacancy rates from like decreasing. We still have the second, high, the second lowest vacancy rates in the whole of the UK, and we're only second behind Cambridge which is a very impressive statistic. And, yeah, that was kind of sorry. But even with these sort of vacancy rates declining, and as Sarah said, us being only behind Cambridge, the main problems in the area, in the city for us, are Coney Street and Goodrum Gate, which both have clustered vacancies. Um, the closure of BHS in Coney Street still has an impact, and because it's right in the middle, it's one of the most noticeable ones. Um, rents on Coney Street were defined uh, as red hot within the rent map and that meant that trying to resolve vacancy issues became really difficult with most properties being owned by pension funds and portfolio holdings meaning ownership is removed and unresponsive and with regards to Goodrum Gate the narrow street and lack of nearby disabled parking was found to be the lead to the cluster of vacant premises despite being rents being a third of the per square square foot rates of Coney Street another particular issue for Goodrum Gate was the challenges in the public realm including the collection of rubbish and the narrow pathways and there was also particularly I think this summer we all saw the reliance on rainfall to try and clean the streets 
and how with the heatwave we really struggled with this and trying to upkeep the appearance of the public realm and make it like attractive to visitors. Um, business rates were also raised as an issue, particularly like with Coney Street and Goodrum Gate. They can add 50% on to the already rent value of a property, so they were very problematic for local business owners. Uh, when discussions with businesses were also had, other key issues that were identified were the removal of A-boards as a form of advertising in the city centre, as well, in, as well as the rising number of hen and stag dues. However, many retailers did recognise that hen and stag dues are a large source of income for licensed premises. So following the work, the scrutiny committee decided to make the following recommendations to yourselves. Um, the council, they recommended that the council should fully support the work and ambitions of Indy York, whether this be just through word of mouth or through a grant to try and support the work of the organisation. Um, it also suggested that we consider making a bid to the £675 million, million fund to the future high streets, as well as preparing a long-term strategy to make York's high streets and the city centre fit for the future. And the, the committee also recommended that we develop an easy but comprehensive and consistent guide to try and help businesses access relevant information with regards to planning and licensing. Uh, in regards to festivals, it suggested that uh, the council examines ways of extending the city's traditional festival venues, so Parliament Street, and to open up other areas to visitors, uh, work with Indy York, as Sarah said, and traders to develop a city-wide loyalty scheme to make it easier for businesses to reward their customers and also make the people uh, shop more locally and to incentivize ways to further encourage more people to use the park and ride and work with the bus operators to extend the opening hours. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> so, um, before we... Uh, moving to discussion of this item, I'm going to ask Councillor Pavlovic to talk about how the Scrutiny Committee um, concluded what's in the report and basically if there's any additional material around the edges that we should be thinking about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you both to Sophie and Sarah uh, for very comprehensively outlining um, the work that the Scrutiny Committee has, um, has undertaken. This is, an, in, in, in my view, um, an incredibly prescient and, and, and timely report. Um, we all know that the health of the High Street and of the city centre um, is not just a local, but it's, a, it's also a, a national issue. The work that the Scrutiny Committee undertook was over a period of three committee meetings. Um, it was essentially a, a whole committee task review. And uh, I'd like to thank all the members of the Scrutiny Committee for, for their time and um, interest and, and research um, into the various meetings that we had. We talked to specialists from across the range. Sophie and, and Sarah undertook a, a number of face-to-face -face meetings with independent traders. Um, we also talked with Make It York and The Bid. Um, it was clear to us when we came up with the recommendations that we um, that we have and that we commend to you for your consideration is that deciding where York is going to position itself is a piece of work that is going to involve a long-term strategic plan. The work of the Centre for Cities report that came out a couple of days ago to some extent reinforces the fact that, yes, there are many positive issues in York, um, but we also have more businesses closing than are starting up. Um, our productivity rates are low and our wages are actually decreasing um, at um, the highest rate for a city um, in the country at £65 per week. 
So how we position ourselves in a climate in which the dependence on flagship high street big national retailers may not be as um, permanent as once we imagine that they might be is something that we, we, we as a council um, and as members really need to take into account. I'm more than happy to answer any, uh, any specific questions, but I think that that's um, a brief overview. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I read this report with interest. Um, it tells me quite a few things that I think we probably already knew. I think the question is, some issues here, for instance, how do we've got a high number of tourists, despite the fact that Leeds is the regional retail hub, but are they, to put it bluntly, spending enough? Are they helping us to get that GVA growth across all sectors um, into, into being? Um, and I say that because both retail and tourism are the sectors with the lowest GVA in the city's economy, basically. Um, and I, I thought, you know, the comment in page paragraph 13 that York is the second most visited city in the UK, there's, there must be a story, there must be a message in that that we might find ourselves able to take advantage of. So for me, this report has got uh, a lot of potential and I hope that members will want to explore that too tonight. Uh, I'm happy to make my own contribution as, as the discussion goes by, but I'd like to perhaps ask anybody else who would like to comment on this. Councillor Colby. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Sarah and Sophie and uh, Michael. Um, I'd, I'd really love to hear your response to the points that were made by uh, our public speaker, um, uh, particularly with reference to office accommodation, the loss of office accommodation, and the specific suggestion of uh, trying once again to see whether uh, an Article 4 directive in connection with that and the conversion of office accommodation into retail development is something that you would consider might belong here or not. W was there anything within your inquiries and the outcomes of that that might point in that direction or not? Uh, there's been a lot of talk about that and how, uh, as was said earlier, how that actually people having offices would make them come onto like, Coney Street, for example, within their lunch break. Um, and within our team, we're doing lots of work at the moment looking at how that's viable. Um, the problem at the moment is a lot of the shops have space on top of them. Um, but it's either accessing them. For some of them, for example, you have to walk through the restaurant on, or what not to get to the office above. If you've got waste from uh, upstairs, can that be put out on the street? Car parking, things like that. So there is a lot of work that we're doing currently to look at it as well. Um, we're also looking as a team uh, within York Central and how we can put office space onto there as well so that we can then, people will eventually be able to go into the high street and use that as well. Um, but it is something that definitely needs to be looked at um, and see how we can work, marry the two together because essentially going in at lunchtime is what people really want to do so they don't have to do it after work like they currently might have to be doing. Councillor, sorry, Councillor Barnes and then Councillor Cram and now Councillor Pavel. When you get the chance. Yes. Sorry. Is that my turn? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't really um, I was going to make exactly the same point to Councillor Colwick. So if I adapt slightly, um, I think the specific question was whether the council would be willing to apply for Article Four direction. Um, is that something that? is in train, is there appetite for? Because I'm not sure that was particularly addressed. Yes, I don't know whether it would be for Mike to answer at all. Would you like to uh, join us to talk about Article 4 directions, uh, Mike, please? As uh, <coughs> Dave Merritt alluded to, uh, a lot of work was done by economic development colleagues and planning colleagues. Uh, some time ago when there were opportunities to put forward uh, for Article 4 directions. Uh, we put a case not for a, 
a blanket Article 4, but it was a well-considered, in my opinion, Article 4 that was selected in terms of certain parts of the, the city centre, um, along with, I think, probably the majority of requests that came across the country, they weren't accepted, which has left us in a difficult position. And those headlines are constantly, for example, in London, you see mm. issues about continued loss of um, office accommodation. Um, I guess we could revisit that. I was trying to remember whether we need to get government approval for that. And I think that is a sticking point because clearly, it's not a political comment, clearly the government wish to have the flexibility. So we, an article 4 direction would run contrary to, to that policy direction that's set at a national level. Um, I said we did make a very specific uh, case for York. Uh, as a comprehensive case based on the evidence that was available at the moment. Uh, we could review that and clearly, um, as you will all recognise, we could, I guess, demonstrate where there have been losses since that first request was, uh, was made. Um, my sticking point is the issue, I think, about uh, just checking whether or not it needs government approval, because I think, again, it, it, it was a hard hurdle the first time. I'm not sure it would be any easier uh, um, at this time. Yeah, um, I was also wondering if you had any sense off the top of your head as to how much grade A office space there is left in the city centre at the present time um, after the conversion of like of Eva's office and things like that. Um, and, and one of the issues has been, apologies for not using the mic earlier, one of the issues in York has been the, the limited amount of grade A office accommodation in the city centre. There's plenty of grade B and C, and there's lots of historic buildings that have offices over shops and other uses, uh, but they're not generally grade A office accommodation. Um, as you know, yes, we, we, we've lost the Aviva uh, building. Uh, the new development is taking place out here. Despite our efforts to persuade the developers, uh, we'll have more residential elements than, than office in the new building, so there will be a net loss, which I think is particularly disappointing given its proximity to the station, to the city centre, and to York Central. Um, I don't have the, the, the figures to hand in terms of the amounts that have been lost, but I guess that, that is something we, we could look at. Okay, um, Councillor Colwick, is it relevant to this point? Yes. Yes, in which case, we'll so can I, when you've finished. Can I, if I summarise in this way, would you agree with what I'm saying? You do feel that if it were possible to uh, apply an Article 4 directive to the context of conversion of, of office space, that would be a desirable thing, recognising that it may at this point in time not be possible to do that, but nevertheless it would be something that would be of benefit in terms of at least seeing whether there would be some, some possibility of the government uh, yeah. giving that, that the, consent. The Article 4 direction wouldn't prevent people from putting planning applications in and seeking to satisfy planning committee about the circumstances of their particular case. <coughs> so if, for example, they had a particular office building that had been vacant for, I don't know, a number of years, despite marketing it appropriately and having a reasonable uh, rental or income target, uh, then they could, you could accept that as a change of use to, a, to another use. And clearly, in many cases, it's preferable to have a, a viable use of our buildings rather than vacant buildings. Um, so I think, I think there would be some advantages in that. And it would, it would have to be, a, I think, a selective Article 4, as it was in our first attempt, shall we say. Uh, on, on certain streets and say, certain areas within the city centre that are under the most pressure. Okay, yeah, sticking with this point, Councillor Pavlovic wants to come in. Uh, do you want to raise this as well? Or? Um, I can put my supplementary on top of my other Okay, fine. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, just, just to respond to where this might fit in with the recommendations, as part of the long-term strategy, um, I think defining what the remit of that would, could absolutely um, include what we do with the office space um, conversions to hotels. 
I think from my um, last research into um, Class O permitted development, um, you do have to get Secretary of State's um, permission to, to, to apply. Um, but there's also, there's also um, some moves from national government um, about how city centres are redesigned, if you like, um, so that vacant office spaces above shops, for example, in the city centre, might then be converted to single residential. I think when we're looking at the big office blocks, the Avivas, the Hudson Houses, um, that's, that's one issue. Something above a store um, on Coney Street might lend itself very nicely to being converted into, um, into a residential property. So, and, and part of the High Street, uh, Future High Street um, Fund is to look into that's that that very question as to um, how do you repurpose your, your city centre? How do you reimagine your city centre? Um, how do you improve your evening economy? That might not necessarily be that much of a, a, an issue if you're talking about ha hen and stag parties, but it might be for residents being able to access things in the um, in the city centre. So I, I think. To take Dave's point about, we I don't think we we need to exclude it from being part of the wider city centre um, strategic plan. Okay. Um, thank you. I'm going to move on to Councillor Cram and then Councillor Pavlovic. You're going to go back with your original point. I think I just made. Oh it. right. Okay. <laughs> fine, fine. Okay. So, so I would start also with my supplementary, which is probably now rather common than a question to um, the topic about office conversion, because I do think, particularly after Councillor Pavlovich was describing all the, um, the details as he did that, we probably don't have so many office, just office buildings, which would be the main goal for being protected as office buildings left. Um, so they are already gone or converted or half converted. And the other question um, about what are we doing with the space above the shops and um, Sophie described um, the problems in using it as an office space at the moment when you have to go through the restaurant to access it. The same applies there if you want to convert it into residential. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Use so it's it's more the use. Uh, the question is: there any best practice out there that you put this completely vacant space up there? And I do understand businesses are concerned because if you have to give access or for fire regulations and all these kind of things, why you don't necessarily want to have another use up there? But for us as a city where there's any space at a premium office or residential, what can be there the options that we um, can put? these empty spaces into uh, that's it. Um, in, in terms of um, the larger office block, you, you're quite right, there's, there's not a huge amount left. In terms of um, the smaller ones and the uh, use of upper floors, there's been initiatives from successive governments over many years across the whole country to try and get beneficial uses of upper floors. In some cases, I think some of the research has found that some of the difficulties may lie in some cases where premises are owned by uh, multinational outlets, where they, their business model is to do with the ground floor trading areas largely. And if those ground floor trading areas are performing as they would hope, then they don't need, so to speak, uh, to have a, a, a use of an upper floor. And sometimes in places like York with a historic buildings, sometimes access to the upper floors is problematical in terms of getting a direct access uh, or difficult sort of passageways to the rear and new staircases outside, et cetera, et cetera. But more importantly then, I think that research has found that 
where there are parts of chains, of high street chains, the less, re the less uh, amenable to having upper floor uses. Their concerns are that you have a flat on the upper floors, there's a, there's a, a burst pipe or the washing machine leaks and you end up with water coming down to your store. What I think has been found is that it, where you have independent owners and sometimes local owners, they are more amenable to perhaps to maximising the use of the space and finding beneficial uses. And I think in planning terms, there's always been an acceptance that those upper floors could have a variety of uses. In some cases, they will work for some people as offices for the businesses that perhaps don't employ a large number of people. Uh, in some cases, they will work for, for residential. But I think it's always been the case that uh, planning authorities across the country have tried to encourage the ma and maximise the use of the floor spaces within both towns and cities. So my original question <laughs> was trying to go back a bit to the, the retail um, discussion because on the one side, we heard that um, there's a rise in food and beverages, um, which is reasoned with um, there's a higher number of visitors coming to York. Is that something that we see maybe with retail as well? Um, I understand we're keeping <laughs> above the float of other towns in, um, and cities in the UK, but can we see if we're looking at the specific retail, if particularly the retail that is also orientated at visitors is surviving more than the ones which is offering services normally just for residents? Because as an example, not a lot of visitors from overseas coming to York buying a washing machine in the city center. Um, that is more something that is aimed for local residents and um, from the anecdotal evidence of reading the local paper and following which shops are closing down it always looks more that the shops are closing down which are not catering for international or national visitors but more for the local needs of local residents. Uh I think that is very true if we look at, as you said, the press that we've been looking at recently, it is very much um, shops that are, like BHS for example, that are for you know, local residents. If you're a visitor, you're not necessarily going to come and visit BHS. Um, but I think a lot of those ones have come from like, higher authorities. Um, a lot of the time from the research that we've done by going out and speaking face to face uh, to a lot of shop owners who are independent shop owners um, who cater more obviously for the visitors, their shops drastically are not as closing down as much as these larger retailers that we are seeing. Um, and I think that's why some of the recommendations that are being made are more focused towards the independent retailers because they do offer something both for the local people as well as the visitors, whereas a lot of the shops that we've seen on Coney Street, for example, that have shut down are, as you said, more for the, pe more for the local people rather than visitors themselves. Is it on this point? Yeah, can. Okay. Yeah, I think I don't disagree with, with what you're saying, but I think we've just got to be a bit careful about potentially drawing too big a trend from some of the large retailers because they're names that people know. You know, so for example, you mentioned BHS, which closed down about three years ago. Um, the previous report that went to the, the scrutiny committee talked about Woolworths, which closed, I think, 11 years ago. We've got a few names that have closed down quite a few years ago but because they're famous, we all know them. So obviously Debenham's another one that if that was the close in York, if you look at York in that, in that same period, numerous independents have closed down. So, uh, and indeed the, the rate of failure among small businesses is far, far greater than the rate of failure amongst big businesses. It's just, we know the big names. We don't know, you know, Stubbings and Co, um, odd bits or blogs and you know all those sort of things in the in the same way so you know just that's what it's making really because I, I were you going to ask further question on this point yes please do then. please do yeah. I, I think that's i think that's very valid which is why um we looked at how we can support those small businesses to be able to set up, navigate their way through those difficult, perhaps, first few trading, trading years. 
and I know that that was one of the issues that Sarah and Sophie um, looked at in depth, and, and I know it's in their recommendation four, but I just wonder whether it might be worth just you really quickly summing up what the issues that um, small traders felt that CYC could specifically do to make that transition from nothing to self-employed um, small shopkeeper. Because I thought it was incredibly relevant and it is maybe something that we, we could do quite quickly. Sorry, I, I didn't want to cut. No, that's fine. If you want to do that, I think it would be helpful. I want to come in with a different topic in a moment. Are you going to want to talk about the same thing? Uh, yeah. Right, okay. So, um, can you respond to that briefly and then I'll pick up another topic. Um, so there was a couple of different issues that different independent businesses raised with us when we went to have conversations with them. Um, one of them was just a lack of communication from the council as a governing body, whether that be through maybe a road closure like Fosgate whenever it came to like the, the York Marathon and things like that. They felt that they weren't made aware of this in time to then plan and strategize for that day. Like we spoke to one business that lost, I think, two hours trading because they didn't realize it was happening because it wasn't communicated to them efficiently. Another thing was as well how different planning and procedure and licensing works and how different bodies look for different, like, different rules, different regulations. And they felt this wasn't really communicated effectively either. Another issue that was raised was the removal of A-boards. So A boards were removed as health and safety and a lot of retailers and businesses accepted this and felt, yeah, okay, fair enough. But nothing was ever actually put in place to maybe replace them as a means of advertising. And a lot of them also weren't aware that you could apply maybe for licensing. I actually didn't find that out until a few hours ago. So it's something, just kind of lack of communication in general and just how the council supports businesses and how we try and maybe help them in the different issues that they face. And then the big one that's always sort of discussed is the business rates. Um, we were speaking to one business that if he was moved, if he had five shops further up the street, he'd have to pay £9,000 more than what he was currently paying. Um, and for a lot of them, they said that you cannot afford. It sort of works out sometimes it could be up to 50% more in business rates, which is the equivalent to you know one staff member. Um, and they were, the suggestion that came from a lot of the businesses is that if there was some sort of process in that small independent businesses who have just started up could have a relief period over, so one year they don't pay business rates, the second year they pay a little bit more, just so that they can understand how much they need to be earning to make over, to turn over a profit, as well as paying their staff, as well as paying all of their bills on top of that, and that way it would ease them in and give them longevity because they know what they need to do to survive in the city. Cheers, thank you. Okay, that, uh, oops. That's, uh, that's uh, very helpful, thank you. Uh, I wanted to kind of, I know that the conversion of offices into um, uh, residences, particularly residential properties, is a real problem. But I wanted to ask a question, for instance, has there been a drift of employment opportunities from the city centre to the rest of the city? If you look at paragraphs 10, 10 in particular, you'll see that we've lost a total of 2,800 jobs in the city centre and only gained 1,800. Those are the two, those are the figures at the top of, of page 11. So that l net loss of 1,000 jobs is counteracted somewhere because we have the same, the same paragraph says the overall total number of the jobs in the city was static. So is that suggesting there's a drift of employment out of the city centre? Is that a, a, a point that could be worth investigating? I can imagine, so we haven't really looked into it and it definitely is worth investigating, um, but I do imagine that it has probably drifted out of the city centre. As we've said, that office space has reduced in the city centre. That office must have gone somewhere else, meaning that obviously people have gone with it. Um, and as we've said, because a lot of, over the last couple of years, a lot of jobs have been um, gone away within the city centre as well. People have found these jobs elsewhere. But as I've previously said, it's not something that we specifically looked into, but it's something that we definitely can, and as a team we will be looking into it as well in our sort of wider portfolio of work. OK, 
Okay, thank you. I've still got Councillor Pavlovic and Councillor Cram. Are, are you wanting to... No, okay, thank you. Councillor Cram. Um, maybe a first comment um, to the topic before. If it says over the past 15 years this job has been lost, I think we just have to imagine which out of the satellite out of town shopping centres hasn't been there 15 years ago, and I think that could already explain some of that um, movement quite quite easily. The other topic, um, because I think while we're looking at that paper, and not that I not always enjoy a good general discussion about um, the economy of the city and the city centre, is that we want to look into the different individual topics which could lead to a policy um, development. So my question would be from all these different recommendations, which one are already covered in our current ongoing review of the general economic strategy? Are you, is that a question addressed to me? Um, that was, of course, we always speak through the chair, but I was floating the question, and whoever wants to pick it up and can provide an answer, I would be happy to listen. Yeah. I, I, I think that the, tre the sort of underlying trend of comment in this paper is that actually some of our strategy work could be more focused and it could have a clearer, uh, a clearer intent. <laughs> Councillor Stewart's going to comment on that, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. Um, and I think just to sort of, to, to really come back to the theme about how we can, we can potentially make a difference, and again, coming back to the point about um, office space and city centre that, that Dave uh, Merritt talked about. And, you know, for me, I, I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't like the whole idea of the Article 4, because I think, as has been said, the officers that, you know, have gone you know, are most of them almost, or a significant amount. Um, and there are some positives, and a lot, a lot of it's market forces. So, for example, Hudson House, um, I think that when Hudson House was sold, everybody assumed it would be purely flats, didn't they? I mean, that was the, the assumption. And it was actually a positive when um, the developer said they're going to put quite a bit of office space or some office space in as part of it. Um, but where I do think we can make a difference is on this thing about um, offices above shops. And, and we've all talked about the difficulties and, and why things are really hard. Um, but I think that's the one particular area where we could try and, and make a difference. So we could say, of all of the floors around, sorry, all the upper floors around York, where we've got, you know, nothing going on. And you can, if you walk down a lot of streets, although it's looking up, you can see, you can get an idea for just how many of these spaces are just vacant, that they are just excessively empty storage or, or something like that. Um, and yes, some of them are going to be owned by um, you know, landlords that aren't bothered. And obviously, yes, there's going to be an element where people will say, we will protect our, our forecourt because it's, you know, it's not worth the hassle of if, if we have a, a flat there or an office there or something like that, and something goes wrong and there's access issues. But I just think that's the one thing that people could potentially dig on and we, and we, you know, we could make some, some difference on personally. Okay. Um, Councillor Barnes? Just to counter your point, uh, Councillor Stewart, I think the strength of potential Article 4 direction, recognising that the quantities are lower than they were when we were talking about it eight years ago, um, where I would see the advantage is uh, retaining the, the rights of giving permission and the council, at the moment they're getting permitted rights, they can just crack on and get on with it. Um, if we retain that power, then in developing a long-term strategy, the council can apply permission holistically. Therefore, if the next big building, I'm just going to pick on English Heritage, for example, if that building, there was a lot of change of use, that then we could think about it strategically within the city. If we are still retaining the right to grant permission, um, then we could refuse to actually let them fit in with our long-term strategy, and then the developer would be forced to consider upgrading into office space. So I think for me, that's where the advantage comes, is just regaining the power locally, where right? we don't really have that power. Um, I, think, I think probably a failure of the government policy in the first place, that they took that power away from us, um, which means that potentially we've dealt with what was it, six years of loss of office space that we've had no power over. Um, obviously, the government had their intentions, but I think that's where I see the advantages of local 
decision making to help fit into any kind of long term strategy that we might develop. Okay, I've got Councillor Cram now. Councillor Pavlovic, do you want to speak? Yeah, after Councillor Cram. This time I would I'm give it back. <laughs> <laughs> I would absolutely, I'd absolutely agree with Councillor Barnes that it's, it's about how it fits in to the longer strategy and uh, the wider long term strategy for the city about where you're going to go in the future. And the reason that um, I think you were asking Councillor Cram um, about where does this fit in with our existing economic strategy it's about drawing where the, the city centre and the high street is um, into how we then subsequently make decisions in other areas. The, the law of unintended consequences. Um, you may do something about car parking charges. Um, car parking charges go up what extent does that impact on the future of the city centre? It might meet your environmental aims, it might not meet your city centre aims. That's just, a, that's just one e e example. Um, and that's why I think having something that, that's specifically focused on and that asks the difficult, and, and that asks the difficult questions of all of all portfolios, of all departments, how do these things fit into the wider city strategy as, uh, as well, is, is, is where I think this recommendation came from. Um, it's about where are, we, where are we going? We kind of know where we are, um, or we think we know where we are. It's what is it going to look like? Um, um, and, and we may end up having to conclude uh, that the last economic strategy, for example, talked about York becoming almost a theme park um, because of its, its, its history. Um, and it may be that that's, that's what we say, you know, we are our tourist offer in the city centre. I don't know that that's, that's where the piece of work comes in. Um, I've got Councillor Cram and then Councillor Stewart. So, coming back to the original question that I floated, what are the, the areas um, where we could look into or what is already covered by the economic strategy? And if I look at the different recommendations, um, the first one regarding the grow the independent business sector is probably something where we really say if we take that commitment seriously, it needs to be reflected in our new economic strategy for the whole city because we learned it is connected to tourism and because retail is a significant pillar of our current economic. Um, so that would be something where I don't think we need to have something extra. We can do that as part of the re general um, renewal of the economic strategy and keeping that in, in mind there. I don't think we're needed for the future high street fund. I think there are probably other people who um, can have a closer look into the details how to get the most useful money out of that um, in, in the long term. What I also, the third one is also something that should be part of the general retail strategy um, of the economic strategy for York. I don't think we are the right um, body here to work collectively on a booklet that is explaining the detail there. I do support that motion, but I think with um, passing that, um, that on to, um, to the relevant department to work on that is probably more um, goal orientated than sitting around the table and saying, um, oh, different picture here or um, a different headline there. The next one, five, is actually one that I would be interested in um, to maybe have a cl more closer look. Um, I think we also around this table had that discussion already um, that 
the, the question, how do we promote the different spaces that we have in, um, in York? And this is not just a city center thing. Um, I mean, we have the race course, we have the Neas Maya as a, a festival um, locations. So, but to more, make a more decisive decision from a, a council perspective to say these are actually the locations that we would like to push and also for different purposes or that things like we don't want to have more than five events in that location because we know it's a brilliant location but we can't um, burden the residents in that area the whole summer of festivals or other things that we're saying, okay, what kind of incentives are we giving people that they're not doing their event in Parliament Street or in another location which is disrupting the whole working of the, the city centre? I think that could be actually an, an interesting um, point to look a bit more holistic into York as an event um, destination and what are we doing there with the public um, realm. Um, Regarding six and seven, I haven't um, made up my mind yet, but I will come back <laughs> to that in a moment. Okay, Councillor Stewart. Okay, fine. Um, yeah, I'd like, I mean, I'm, I'm really interested in one or two of the ideas that come up here. For instance, the, um, the idea of, the, of a York pound. So we have a circular economy where money is spent within York, by York residents, on York independent traders and that effectively retains a lot of that spend in York. It's widely known that spending with the national retail uh, chain will produce perhaps 4 or 5% of that money remaining in York. The rest of it goes off to head office somewhere. Um, so that's one, one thing. And that, that, um, the idea of a York pound, which isn't actually a separate currency, it's just a way of, how can I put it, place marking, sterling, by actually allowing for an accumulation of sterling within a neutral area, such as in the case of Bristol, the Bristol pound, a credit union. And people uh, create accounts with the credit union and it's passed out to local traders in the way of, of, of their normal retail activities. Question of how do we um, place uh, uh, festivals around the city? Um, a few years ago, we had something of a shortage of festivals. It wasn't a total shortage, but we suddenly seemed to grow the number of festivals. Now, far be it from me to suggest that we should have much less, but it seems to me that if you could find um, areas in which to hold them, you might take some of the load off the city centre. And I know that's a question of perhaps traffic and a transport to deal with, but for instance, the balloon festival being held out at the race course has got decided advantages in one sense, although disadvantages as far as traffic and transport are concerned in, in the other one. But on the other hand, that is an, a wonderful venue for that kind of event. It happens once a year, so maybe that's not too much of a load on an, an ancillary venue. So it must be, it seems to me there are other possibilities there. Um, what was I? I was going to mention the question of the Parliament Street versus um, the Castle Car Park versus Shambles Market. Uh, on page 20, there's a question about what is the long-term future of Shambles Market? Can we keep it lively and help it to animate the city centre? question to me is, is Shambles Market being interfered with by larger events in Coney Street, such as various fairs and festivals? Is it interfering itself? What would be the effect of changes to Castle Car Park? So those are the kind of things that I think um, are, will need to be considered. The question is, how do we do it? Um, I believe that some of the recommendations in this report are the kind of things that should be considered. I'm not clear that it will emerge in those exact forms. And the question then for me is, how do we translate this? Not necessarily through this committee, but maybe through a further forum of some kind. And whether it's done through officers alone or whether it's done in conjunction with or just by members, then that, I think that's open to debate at the moment. I've got Councillor... Did you finish your point, Councillor Stewart? It's or did you wave it? Right, OK. I've got Councillor Cramney. 
just directly in response to what you said, Chair, I think the main partner there is Make It York, um, because the Shambles Market, for example, is also a question that they raised during their review of their service level agreement. Um, and I think also the, the event um, bit is something that, through the public statement of the now retired um, director of Make It York was one area they wanted to look into how to um, yeah, concentrate on some of the events, making better events and not necessarily the, the um, more events, or changing also the timing. And I think one example was this year, the ice trail, where the feedback was it was before during the busy Christmas season and it was just an add-on um, and traffic was anywhere in the city center for, for Christmas so they now moved it into the early beginning of the new year so that they have another event um, there to create um, interest there. And I think this is probably the, the same intention that the chair was, um, was indicating. So it might be that Make It York would be the partner to speak and it could be this committee just getting an, an update on that. Yes, thank you. I mean, I think um, Make It York is quite right in terms of it being the sort of festival. Uh, it's not the organiser, it's the mm. festival, I suppose, coordinator. Um, and I suppose that Indie York or whatever independent umbrella organisation exists is the right organisation to deal with the independent traders rather than trying to speak to 100 or 200 or whatever. Um, so it, that, that's the kind of problem for me. These recommendations of themselves are a good basis to continue on. I think that they need sharpening and focusing, and that's not a, that's not a, a, a negative comment. It's just that you ask the question, for instance, you know, um, how do you incentivise uh, more people to use park and ride? There must be different strategies for making that happen. And I think that's, it's not just a political point, it's an operational point as well. Do you want to respond, Councillor Pablo? I've got Councillor Cram waiting. Um, ab absolutely, Chair. The, the, this is not, um, this isn't the end product. This is the, this is the start of the, uh, uh, of the process. Um, if, if tonight, if policy uh, agrees to take these recommendations, some or all of them, forward, that's when the work will then start. Just, just w one point on that, um, that perhaps we did omit, is a timeline, really, uh, and, and I'm mindful that, um, that this um, committee put forward some recommendations um, last January. Um, and they're, they're mentioned in paragraph 55. And we don't really want to be waiting a year or 18 months or two years before we get any traction and progress um, on, um, on the recommendations because time, time, moves, time moves away from you. Um, the loyalty scheme there are many, many different um, models. Um, Sophie and, 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 and Sarah did a, a very good paper with examples of different types of, of model. We need to do um, an analysis of what would fit York best. Um, and then that needs to go, that needs to go forward. Um, can that be done? independently of the overall strategy? Well, I, I'd suggest that, yes, it could. Um, the work with Indy York, um, could that, take, you know, could, could their work be enhanced outside of developing the strategy first? I, I would argue, yes, it could. That's why they're separate. That's why they're separate recommendations. So that's just to clarify why they are in the form that they are. Okay, do you want to come back, Councillor Graham? Uh, yeah, just maybe a brief comment regarding six and seven of the recommendations. And I think the point that Councillor Pavlovich just made regarding the emphasis on really working there with 
in New York or the business improvement district or um, because I don't think that is a point where actually the council can implement something because we decide that's the best thing for York. That is one of these initiatives which must come from the business and we can then promote and encourage and um, go to all the business that they're aware of um, these kind of schemes. But that is something that already need to have attraction and there need to be a clear buy-in from, from the businesses that it is theirs and not we coming there as the people who know everything and saying that's how you, you, you run the business um, there. Regarding seven, because some of you still remember the whole discussion we had about the tendering for the, um, for the park and ride. And um, on the one side, there were also, because of the retendering, um, things that might not have made it in the tender that people wanted in the in the first place but if we have a timeline now when is the next retendering coming up um, that we early in that process already set that on the agenda looking again what are the current conditions that we are setting and what are potentially um, enhancements that we can do of course there are things that we saw this Christmas that there was an extension of the, the operating hours, but it's my understanding, and if somebody knows better, please correct me, that it was more a voluntary um, agreement with the park and ride um, running company. So as long as we're not reaching a new retendering process, there's nothing that we could do from a regulatory um, perspective. Stuart, thank you. Yeah, I think Councillor Cram may have answered the point I was about to make, which is that this doesn't need to have to in any way be about retendering. And, and the example that you gave about the voluntary incentives last Christmas are exactly the point that um, in terms of how the, um, the tender was done, then obviously, yeah, we can't get them to open more, everything like that. But we can just sort of say, this is why it makes sense for you, we think. And they can say, well, actually, we don't think it does because of this, this and this. And then we can say, well, we'll change all of those things to make it easier for you. So for me, it's entirely voluntary, and it literally is just working with the park and ride operator. Obviously, the key thing there is it says incentivises, uh, rather than it having to be anything about the tendering, because that would then be a whole new minefield of costs and benefits and all that sort of thing. And I would assume several years off. I don't know how often is it. Is it 10 years or something? So when, it's, a lengthy, it's a lengthy period. Where yes, some of us may even not be here, you know, potentially. I should say that. The Green Council at that time will sort that out. <laughs> well, for me, unless anybody wants to raise specific uh, questions about any one of these, either the recommendations or the various comments in the report, I think it gives us a starting point. I think the question is how do we take it further? And um, perhaps um, that is something that we may not be able to start tonight. I would rather. Um, value uh, Simon Burton's input into that one at a minimum. Um, and I certainly think that um, portfolio holders, the current portfolio holders should be consulted because it may be a matter that has to be uh, taken over by the new administration after May. So the best we can do, I think, is to, is to get it uh, started. So um, I think if members are happy to accept the recommendations that are um, here, uh, incidentally, in terms of paragraph 55, I think that um, it would be interesting to hear uh, from um, the uh, top level planning team about how item two is being um, implemented. This is the seeking ways of protecting and utilising the city's stock of historic buildings, which is a bit of a, a chestnut that we've, we've, we've played around with in the past, but it's possible that perhaps under the local plan, as and when agreed or modified or whatever is going to happen to it, we may be able to do something positive there. I make it your, we have a new director, so um, those two areas. I happen to know that things have happened with the bid, although they perhaps haven't been obviously reported, particularly in terms of street rangers, in terms of moves to improve street furniture and wayfinding, those are actually about to be... Are they about to be decided or have they just been decided? 
Can I just come in there? Sorry, sorry. I um, if I could just come in there. Um, an update on the implementations of the recommendations of this review is going to the scrutiny committee at its next meeting, so hopefully those questions will be answered then. Okay. I just want to give members a flavour that actually things have been happening, although perhaps not directly reported on. Councillor Cram. Could we just have an, an update when the new economic strategy draft is coming back to this committee? Because I remember that that was also in the beginning of this year that there's a... I do apologise, I missed the first sentence. The new economic um, strategy for York, where we did different exercises before, um, and we met with Simon and discussed different things. I think, if I remember right, there was in the beginning of this year, before the next local election, another um, round where this committee was supposed to have input and see what the, the next draft will be. Is that something that we can already... We haven't got that on the work plan for the next meeting, but it seems to me that this is the opportunity to actually uh, get this ball moving. But as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly clear in my own head that this is going to have to be taken up after May mm -hmm. with, with the new administration in due course. And maybe the best thing we can do is to leave the, on the table a further analysis of what's in these recommendations and perhaps some uh, way forward some suggested way forward. So, a new administration, did you say? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Councillor Cole. <clears throat> Thank you. Given the conversation that we've had in the early part of this meeting about the Article 4 directive, um, I, I heard one or two um, voices to the contrary, but I, I think most of us responded saying that it would be something we'd like to see added to these recommendations. I would be interested to just sound out the views of the committee on that and if there is sufficient support to see that added to the recommendations. Okay, fine. Can I ask members what they feel about it going round from my left to my right? Can you just repeat the question again? Uh, I'm suggesting, given our conversation about the Article 4 directive and conversion of office accommodation, um, whilst I recognise that we may well be... Um, talking about proverbial stable doors and bolts, I think it is still relevant. I think that it would apply to um, um, office development that hasn't yet been converted, might be converted in the future. Um, even, even as I speak, I'm aware of one development um, right in the heart of the city centre, uh, three storeys of office accommodation. My understanding is that we may well see an application fairly soon for that to be converted to holiday let accommodation. That may or may not be advantageous to the economy of the city. It um, would be interesting to do that kind of exercise. But this is the kind of decision we're, we're, we're making all the while, and I think it would be good for the um, City of York Council to at least have the possibility of influencing the shape of, of um, such developments in the future. We don't have that because there is no Article 4 directive available to us. Uh, I would like to see that added to the recommendations. Okay, then in that case, can I take a straw poll, members, from moving around? I agree. I'd like to see it added. Um, I think where I saw it being added was that um, in around the preparing a long-term strategy, uh, there needs to be some form of consideration given to whether we could still pursue it. Would the government give it permission to do so? How would it look? Um, and I saw that as being part of the preparation of a long-term strategy. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd certainly um, advocate um, investigations. I mean, I've been talking about this in planning um, for over a year now, so yeah, I would absolutely support it. Councillor Cram? I'm happy with an investigation. <laughs> Councillor Stewart? Well, you've got a majority, obviously, for taking it forward. However, uh, I would remain in the contrary view that I think there's lots of lovely phrases about local decision making gives us a choice we can influence our strategy but i think as councillor colwick said um you know the horse has broadly bolted i think if we look at an article four direction and what it directed what it would look like there's all sorts of different views um you, you know and so 
and, and fundamentally, I think it would take up a lot of time. I think it would be a distraction. I don't think the government will allow it, and therefore, I do not think it would be time well spent if we could define what we're even looking for, which I don't believe we can. Councillor Doughty. Well, actually, I'm just uh, substituting today, so I don't feel perhaps uh, I'm worthy of giving sufficient input into this. But as I say, if there's an issue with whether it would be accepted by government, there is a question to be had. Is it, is it actually going to be a waste of time for the committee? Okay, okay thank you. Um, we know what Councillor Colwick's opinion is. My view is I think we should investigate it. Um, I don't think we should say any more than that um, on the grounds that there may be very good reasons for it not to be possible. And uh, I don't think we should make promises that we, we may not be able to keep. So um, I think we'll add that to, um, we'll add that to the recommendations. So, Boris, sorry, Councillor Crabb. Just two more things. Um, also, it's going from this already into the work plan, so, but as this is the only agenda item, I think we can be a bit flexible. Um, maybe using the next and the last meeting of this committee also, maybe getting the new director from Make It York here to just um, getting him outlining his new vision and what he's going to change in the current thing. That would be one thing. And the other thing that I said very much in the beginning regarding recommendation five, with the examine ways of extending the city's tradi traditional festival venue in Parliament Street. I would, if we have time for that, be quite interesting to have that discussion, maybe getting a short presentation about what are actually the different events, venues that we have in York, and um, maybe some conclusions that we could draw out of that if further work could be useful in the future to have a more plan on how to deal with it. Could I just make a point there? It would probably be more beneficial for the new director of Make It York to address the new committee rather than address this committee when it is the last meeting of the cycle. I think, I think perhaps it would be useful to, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it might be useful to, to, to get his feelings on this because I'm, I'm actually going to meet him next week. So um, it might be useful for him to actually say, yeah, actually, I might or might not, uh, particularly in view of the fact that he'll probably be aware of what's come up on tonight's agenda. Um, and he knows that, it, I'm sure he knows that it'll have to be repeated at some point in the future anyway. So anyway, we can pick that one up. Um, okay. Uh, so can we add this item to the work plan for, for the next meeting and we'll probably have um, a, a presentation on the use of uh, other parts of the city centre for events and festivals, maybe some more background uh, perhaps provided by Simon or members of the team and um, that will get this matter moving. Councillor Stewart. Thank you. Yeah, just on the future areas of policy development, could somebody remind me what policy on crossing points is? No. Anyone? Okay. I'm sorry, but this is something I inherited. So I think it, I think it was a suggestion by um, Councillor Richardson when he was on this committee. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I remember right, um, we were talking about the different kind of street crossings from traffic lights, pelican crossings and so on. I think the point that Councillor Richardson at the time meant was looking particularly in the areas where traffic lights are needed or not needed and which kind of policy we are applying, where we putting crossing points, um, if we're putting new ones because he was looking into some sort of new guidelines that changed some things. But at that point, nobody could tell us if we actually have that policy on crosses points or not. Without being unkind, I think that his view as to those guidelines might have been influenced by a particular example. I'm not going to say any more than that. Right. Um, um, sorry, go sorry, on. Are we officially on the work plan now? If members are, if members are happy to 
take those recommendations forward with the addition of the investigation of the Article 4, then it may be that we will actually achieve just the discussion of that as the last item of work that this committee deals with before the end of the municipal year. Councillor Pratt. The supplementary planning guidance was something that we discussed in the connection with the local plan development, and I think we put that on the um, on the keep and watch out um, list that if these guidance going to the local plan working group that we would like to have the opportunity to see them here. I don't know whether they're currently in the local plan process, but if there's still a possibility that we can comment on them before March and it has any influence, then we might put that to the list. I think the local plan working group did look at some items of uh, of supplementary planning guidance to being developed alongside the local plan. Chair, I'm, yeah. Yeah, that's correct. If I can ha assist uh, committee, um, what priorities for York? I'm not quite clear from the description what that would entail in terms of supplementary planning guidance. Uh, Is anyone? Isn't isn't that presumably thinking about the likes of? Should we have HMO policies oh, and where right, councillors yeah, would say we, we need more? In that case, I understand. We, we have uh, a report went to the local plan working group. And members considered about uh, 20 different areas of supplementary planning guidance, and priority was given to two of them. The rest are on the to-do list, but need to follow on from the work on the, the local plan. So HMOs was, was on there. There's a whole raft of things, from green and blue infrastructure to letting boards, HMOs, um, the space standards, there's a range of things that are in there, uh, but clearly the local plan has to be the focus and normally these things follow on from the, the local plan in any event. So that, that means we missed our chance to... No, you know, no the list will, will remain uh, open. There's only a certain amount of work can be done in the short term because it's the same staff resources that are working on the local <laughs> plan that would otherwise work on supplementary planning guidance. What the intention is then to, as local plan work progresses, and if that reaches a conclusion, as soon as that reaches a conclusion, then more resources can be put into to working on those guidance documents. Um, and we will come back with a work programme and advise members accordingly as to uh, how quickly some of them may be quicker uh, and less resource requirements than others to be able to progress. But I don't see it's necessary, it's not a closed list as such. Yeah, just on the, on the second one, the community infrastructure levy, um, my knowledge of, of that is very limited and I sort of view it as we have S106 and it's going to be taken over by the SIL um, and beyond that I don't really know a great deal more and I wonder if other members have far greater you know, knowledge of it or whether that's something that might be worth us looking at because obviously the whole point about this is it's meant to have a more economic effect on growth uh, and it is something as I understand we can influence um, so whether that's something worth us looking at I think I come in again. Well, this needs to follow on again from the local plan. The local plan, we'd have a, an infrastructure delivery plan that follows on from that. We would then seek to deliver things like highway infrastructure, schools, other facilities. And, and the community infrastructure is, is a mechanism then of potentially paying for some of the infrastructure over and above that which developers would be reasonably expected to provide. The decision on that, I think, is many months away for the council. For the council. Uh, and you have to take a decision on against implementing that or retaining section 106. But section 106 has its limitations on pooling arrangements, for example. It's never been discussed at local plan in depth, has it no. though? And whereas obviously things like HMOs or affordable housing, uh, certainly affordable housing have been discussed at length. And I just wonder if it's worth something for the committee to be a bit more educated about potentially, so we know some, some of the options. because. When the local plan signed off, and, and obviously we have all the, the still related to that, and obviously all that's wonderful, there could still be all sorts of other things where there are developments that are not in the local plan in any way, and therefore where we will, as CYC, have a say in them. So I just wonder if it's worth exploring it a bit more. I think you could have that looked at, and the committee could at the very least go away a bit more enriched with knowledge than some of the other things where you know, we might just talk a bit. 
dare I say it. I, I agree entirely. I think it's an issue, an issue for me, Chair, for timing and when it's the appropriate time to do that. And I think it needs to be when we, again, when the local plan has moved a little bit further forward, when getting closer to making that decision. And, and then that might, I think there's an element of looking at what's happened elsewhere in the country, how, how, what good practices, what the options are to go for community infrastructure levy or, or not. Because there are, whilst there are positives in there, there are some, some drawbacks in there. Uh, and just the whole process of, of governing and the mechanisms for that uh, are quite intensive. Leeds have a huge team of, uh, of people on theirs. OK, I've got councillors Cram and Pavlovic, and I think we've, I'm assuming that we've, we've accepted the recommendations. We're going to move forward on those. Sarah and Sophie, if you wish to stay on, that would be fine, but otherwise um, I'll, I'll allow you to, to, uh, to bow out and thank you for your contributions tonight. It's been, been very helpful. Um, Councillor Crump. Um, if I understand the general gist, then we are now formally a lame duck committee. That means we're not going to take up um, a lot of any things which we can't conclude on the day. So the question regarding Councillor Stewart's proposal would be, is it solely for educational purpose? And we learned that our resources, particularly in that department, are quite limited. I would be happy to add it to the work plan if there's actually on the day then something that we would do with that information to carry it over. If it's just for information purposes, then a new committee could look into that. Um, second point, I think the single-use plastic task group um, would need to um, be added there as well. I'm just, uh, I'm just going to do a, a report on the, uh, on the two task groups just in a minute. Councillor Pavlovic. I mean, just on the topic that Councillor Stewart was, was raising um, and, and, and that Mike um, was talking about, um, in respect of the Section 106, what might be beneficial, um, if it falls within the remit of this committee, is to look at the Section 106 obligations that we already have, what the commitments, what the commitments are, how that might be affected those projects might be affected by introducing the um, infrastructure, uh, the community infrastructure levy, the SIL, um, and how many projects, how many projects are, are, are ongoing, and how many are, if you like, out of time. And I think that might be a good uh, analysis um, for this committee to to have a look at, uh, and actually would be quite productive as opposed to just educational. I think my understanding of the way that CIL might be implemented uh, suggests that we'd have to understand very clearly what we're going to do about any Section 106 uh, commitments. Um, since we're in the hands of the local plan process as far as CIL is concerned, what are you well, we, yeah, we, it may, I hope it won't come to that. But um, no, um, I think actually, until we know where, where the local plan is, is is going in terms of both, you know, likely approval, modification, or whatever, and the likely time. To be honest with you, I think, however, it's whatever its educational value. I think we will be focusing on other things between next meeting and. <coughs> whatever the local plan gives us in due course. So it may be that it's best the, to actually put both those issues together once the new administration is formed, whatever its political complexion, and um, pick it up after May. Um, OK, so um, we've got a brief um, report back on the two uh, task group matters that... Um... Yeah, um, the committee has been involved in, um, in two um, scrutiny reviews. Uh, the first one is the um, Residence Priority Parking Scheme. Um, after a slow start, we've, uh, we've made quite a lot of progress on this uh, to such an extent that um, 
uh, last week we had a meeting and we've actually made some recommendations. Um, it was um, a, the, the, the SAS group comprised of Councillor Barnes, uh, Councillor Stewart, Councillor um, Fenton, um, and Councillor de Goyne. Um, and so, they, as you remember, they were tasked with uh, with collating information themselves, and then we got together um, after Christmas, and we've had uh, had a couple of meetings, and um, um, we had a public consultation exercise, which was uh, which was quite well attended. The dozen or so um, residents came and all gave their views. Um, as a, as a consequence of that, uh, we felt we were in a position to make some recommendations, which. Uh, the committee, the task group has done, so I'd ask that that uh, uh, be put onto the agenda for the March meeting, the draft final report for the March meeting. Um, secondly, the single-use plastics. You'll re recall that uh, this stemmed from um, a council motion, um, and um, as a result, um, this committee um, ag agreed that it was worthy of review um, but when they further considered the, um, the motion, there was elements of procurement. Um, so it was also put to CSMC. That resulted in um, an ad hoc scrutiny committee being formed with two members from this, um, from this committee, which were, who are councillors Richardson and... Yeah, the council of and Cram, um, and two members from um, CSMC, um, Councillor Looker and Councillor Fenton. Um, the committees that had two meetings up to now, um, with a further one arranged for, I think it's going to be the 11th of February, uh, which you'll, the meeting that they've had is to understand um, the current recycling practice in York. Um, the next meeting is going to be about the procurement uh, elements of the council motion um, and also with FM to, um, to establish the current use of plastics uh, within City of York buildings. Um, it's likely that we'd need one further meeting. The, the hope is that there will be a draft final report ready for the next meeting of CSMC, which I think is uh, um, the 11th of March. So hopefully both these pieces of work will be concluded by the end of the municipal year. Okay, any thoughts on that, members? No? Okay, well, um, that leaves us with three items on the work plan for the 5th of March meeting. The Resident, the um, recommendations from uh, scrutiny and an Article 4 direction investigation and the draft final report from the President's priority review. And I don't know whether it will be uh, sensible to include the, um, a note to members of what's going to go to CSMC if it's around at that point. On the plastics? Yes. Yes, of course. Of course. Okay. Um, and if you... Sorry. Wouldn't it be good to maybe add also um, a small element of review again of the policy development committee at that um, point? Because we had that interim review where we then carried on with um, working in this way, but taking that this is the last... Um, meeting of this um, committee to see if there's some final recommendation we would like to give the new um, administration if it's worth setting up policy development committees or not. Um, it's the, what Councillor Cram's saying is that if there was an interim recommendation to continue in this format, actually what I don't know is what CSMC are going to recommend um, in terms of committee structures and whether there should be a policy committee or not. Yeah. yeah. Um, so whether, whether we need to have a, a further set of comments, uh, a further kind of interim review, I'm not clear. Um, and I don't know what you know about CSMC. Uh, Sorry, I'm not, I'm not clear what you're asking for, interim review of... The purpose of the policy committee. Sorry. Uh, so should I try to? Yeah. So the the idea to have 
not just the classical scrutiny committees, but the policy development um, committees was that we set up this policy um, development committee as for economy place as a pilot to see if it works. And there was an interim review where we looked into did the initial pilot work or not. At that point, we concluded one of the conclusion was we didn't have um, too much time to actually look at that point into the policy development because we looked very broadly into the different areas we wanted to um, uh, discover. So now that we're actually at the end of the term, maybe members feel more inclined to now offer an opinion if they're thinking that the policy development committee could be something worse that we might want to recommend to CM and CSMC than on the 11th of March right after our meeting, that they could include in their um, um, CSMC are actually having a review of, um, of the scrutiny function and arrangements. Um, they set up a task group to, uh, to look into this. They had a meeting last night. They're in the process of, uh, of formulating some recommendations. Um, as part of the review, they invited all the chairs and vice chairs of the scrutiny committee um, to give their views on whether they thought the new arrangements were working, um, and that's part of the, uh, the CSMC's considerations. So that consultation already happened, or yes? Oh, okay. Well, he said they commissioned it last night. Sorry. He's saying they've commissioned it last night because I'm a vice chair and I've not been asked about it. I'm a vice chair and I haven't been asked. We went to the meeting. The meeting was about. A month ago, yeah. yeah. At least the chair, the chair, yes. the chair was there. Before Christmas. Chris, I don't think you were vice chair then. I think it was Councillor Richardson. Uh, I can't recall that it was advertised as a consultation. I thought we both had meeting. an invitation to that. All the, yep. all the chairs and vice chairs um, were intended, were invited to attend. You were invited, Paul, weren't you? Yes, but as that happens, it was held on a date that I couldn't attend. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to... Were you invited? I, I must have been if I was. I don't remember being invited. Could then maybe the chair just briefly um, feed back to the committee which feedback he gave to, um, to the yes, task can, group on... I can, I can give you... Uh, I didn't give it to... I gave it to CSMC at a meeting. Yes. And I can tell you, basically, I said that... Um, there were difficulties in implementing this uh, system as far as this committee is concerned um, and it was to do with uh, members and officers understanding of the difference between scrutiny and policy development. Um, previously we had committees which were both scrutiny and policy development committee, fine. But once you separate out the two functions you've then got the question of which bit is done, in, this, in our case, we have two committees, one scrutiny, the other one's policy development, which bit does which first? And um, if you took the view that scrutiny just examines what has been done in connection with the issue, what is good about it, what is not so good about it, and then policy development picks it up and says, right, okay, we've got a review of the actuality from scrutiny committee, now what do we do in terms of future policy? That would be how it, in my View, and I think the theory was that that's how it would work. In practice, it's not working quite that way. And I think that that's the issue here. Not least, Chair, because policy meets two weeks before scrutiny. Effectively, that should be the other way around. Um, yep, certainly. Certainly, I think there is a timetabling issue in there as well. And there is also the frequency of meetings as a... As a, as a working uh, difficulty. Could the recommendations from that task group be circulated to members by any chance? The recommendations haven't been, even been agreed by the task group that's looking into it, and I don't think that, uh, that they would share their work with another committee at this stage. That it would need to be approved by CSMC itself, which would then be a published document. OK, so it is going on the 11th of March then to the committee and all committee members are going to wait for the um, published agenda for that one. 
hopefully, that, 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 that's, the, that's the intention, that it'll, be go, it'll go to the next meeting of CSMC. Uh, but as far as recommendations are concerned, they haven't been agreed yet. Okay. Well, with that then, unless anybody else has got anything more to say, I'm going to declare the meeting closed since I have no urgent business. And thank you for attending. Thank you. Thank you.